turn into John chapter 12, where we will be picking up where we left, left off last week. I'm going to pick up at verse 20. John chapter 12. Um, just as a reminder from last week, the, the, you know, where we're at in the account here in John and in the life of Jesus on the earth, his life, was, um, his life was soon to end. His death was approaching quickly, and Jesus knew that. His time had finally, what, come. As you know, we read so many times, his time had not yet come, and so nothing happened to him, but his time had come. And we saw... Um, you know, last week there, some of that, and that, you know, he's, he had, he's, has entered the last week of life in an earthly, in his, in his physical mortal body on the earth. He's into the last week of that life. We saw how he purposely and dramatically rode into Jerusalem on the back of a, of a young donkey. He, he did that specifically and purposely to show what? To, to, he did it to demonstrate that he was, in fact, the Messiah. And why would Ronnie go in the back of that donkey demonstrate that he was, was claiming to be Messiah? Because it was prophesied in Zechariah chapter, chapter 9 that the, that the Messiah king would ride in on the back of a young donkey. And that would have been very notable because normally kings rode into town on what? On white horses. And so all this tied into he was very publicly and purposely now saying, claiming to be the, the, the promised Messiah. And many, many of the Jews believed that he, that he was. And they were, we saw that the, you know, as he rode in, they were very enthusiastically you know, uh, calling out to him using messianic titles. And, and uh, they were looking for him to begin to rule over, the, over this promised nation of Israel and begin his rule as king and deliver them from the oppression of, of the, the Romans. And so all these people were, you know, at this point where they were looking to him, that they thought that maybe this time, the time was at hand where, where Israel, the promised kingdom of Israel would be delivered and Jesus was going to be the one to, to rule over it. And so now let's pick up at verse, verse 20. We'll read 20 through 22 to start. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. Feast of what? The feast of Passover. This is the feast of Passover that whenever Jesus died. And verse 21, And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. These Greeks did. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Well, Philip went to tell Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. So there's a number of questions that, you know, about what's said in these verses that we really don't have answers for. We don't really know who these Greek people were, these Greeks that came to Philip and asked if they could see Jesus. We don't know where they were from. We don't know why exactly they wanted to see Jesus. We don't know why they specifically came to Philip. We don't really know any of those things, but we can make some reasonable guesses about it. They were probably Gentile Greeks who had joined a lot of the, the Jewish pilgrims who you know, lived in surrounding areas who made their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Passover. Um, why? Why would Gentile people have come with Jews to, to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover? Well, at a minimum, they may some of the some of the non-Jewish people became interested in the faith of the Jews. And it, at a minimum, it was probably that, but it may even have been more likely that these non-Jewish people actually had become to believe in the God of the Jews. And so they they came to participate in the Feast of Passover as much as they were allowed to do. Because we need to understand, they were allowed onto the temple grounds, but they could not go beyond what? The court, the court of the Gentiles. Uh, they Actually, if they went beyond the court of the Gentiles within the temple complex, they would be put to death. The Jews would kill them. They would allow them that far. And so, it's possible that, and maybe even more likely, that these were these were. Uh, non-Jewish people who had come to believe in the God of the Jews and participated in what they were allowed to participate in, and now, now they're they're coming maybe to try to find out, you know, well, what what's what's this Jesus guy have to say about us? 
you know, us non-Jews, what, 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 does, what does he have? To, obviously, they heard about him. Uh, maybe they even saw him triumphantly ride into Jerusalem. Um, again, I, they probably wanted to see what he had to say about where they stood as non-Jews. You know, man, you, you know, if you're this great man and everything, I mean, wh wh where's that put us? Like, where do, how do we fit into your, your plan or your vision or whatever? Since John pointed out that they came to Philip, and Philip and, and he pointed out and said that Philip was from Bethsaida um, in Galilee, that might mean that um, they have they had known Philip, or at least knew he was from Bethsaida, because Bethsaida up on the, the up on the Sea of Galilee was very very close to a a Greek. Uh, uh, Greek area where, where a lot of Greek people, Gentile people were at that was known as the De Decapolis. And so, because they lived so close to Bethsaida, some, some scholars think maybe they even knew Philip, even who he was, or at least knew, he, knew who he was because they lived so close to him up there. But these are, we can only guess about these things because the Scripture, the scripture doesn't tell us. And so, they say they'd like to see Jesus, and Philip probably didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to tell him. So he went and talked to who? Andrew. And probably Andrew says, I don't know. We better ask Jesus. And so they both, they both then were going to go on, on and, and tell Jesus about, about these Greeks' request to meet him. Well, we're going to see in the rest of this account today that it doesn't look like Jesus actually ever met with them, these Greek people. He never granted their request to meet him. And they're not mentioned again. Many believe that John mentioned the request of these Gentiles to meet Jesus to show a picture of a coming time, a soon coming time, when many Gentiles would come to Jesus. Not, not in person while He was on the earth, but in saving faith after He what? After He died and rose again and ascended back to heaven. And the church began... We, we know that the, the church began 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead on the day we call Pentecost. And that early church was comprised completely of Jews. And it was in Jerusalem. But eventually, if you read through the book of Acts, eventually Gentiles started coming to faith in Jesus. And eventually many, many Gentiles came to faith in Jesus. And so many believe that John mentioned this to sort of, sort of paint a picture that Gentiles were going to start coming to Jesus before too long as well. Let's read verses 23 and 24. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So now again, Jesus announced that His time had come. In, in reading the following verses, it seems likely that Philip and Andrew probably, f when they went to find Jesus to tell Him about the, the Greeks wanting to see Him, um, they found Jesus in the midst of a, of a group of, of Jewish people. Very likely even in a Jewish part of the temple where the Gentiles uh, couldn't, couldn't go. Because it's clear that there was a crowd around when Philip and Andrew found Jesus and started talking to Him and Jesus started saying these things, it says he, he said a lot of these things that he said out, out to, the, to the whole crowd. Again, I think when it talks about, when Jesus said about it, it was time for the Son of Man to be glorified, I believe, I believe that, that the glorification of Jesus, yes, was it, even in His death and in His resurrection, but ultimately in His ascension back to heaven where He resumed the glory that He had had for all of eternity past before He came to the earth in the incarnation in the form of the, of the little baby in Mary's womb. Jesus illustrated that His coming sacrificial death and, and the spiritual fruit that His death would produce, including some of that fruit is still in this room here this morning in a lot of us. We are the fruit, the spiritual fruit of what was produced because of Jesus' death, right? And so he used an illustration to talk about that. He talked about a, a, a little kernel of what? Weed, weed on, on, a, on a stem of a, of a wheat plant. And he said, as long as that kernel stays attached to that plant, I mean, and it's living while it's attached to that plant and so forth, and as long as it stays there, it can't produce anything, right? 
while it's still alive and attached to the wheat plant. But what happens when that little kernel of wheat falls off and dies and goes into the ground? It grows a, grows a new wheat plant, right? And then it, in itself, then, a whole, head, a whole head of wheat kernels is grown, right? And so he used that illustration to say that he was going to die. And of course, he would go into the ground, so to speak, and going into the tomb. But because of his death, there would be much fruit produced out of his death. And that's why I just gave the example of many of us in here are still some of that fruit that is being produced by the death of Jesus. Verses 25 and 26. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. So Jesus extended this sacrificial illustration about Himself. He talked about Himself, comparing Himself to the kernel of wheat that dies, but then produces all this fruit. He extended that illustration here to those of us who choose to follow Him. It was originally to those people back then, and it's still today. He, he extended the, ap the application of this illustration to us. Eternal life would indeed come to many through the sacrifice of the One, Jesus. But all who accept the sacrificial gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ are also called to do what? Same analogy here. The wheat kernel, Jesus, and us. We are also called to what? To die. We are called as well to sacrifice. We are to die to self. That's what he's doing. He, it's the wheat kernel. It's him. And now he's extended it in these verses for us who follow him. We are also to die. Some of us, not probably, hopefully any of us in here, not overly likely here, but in many parts of the world, people still die for Jesus. But if nothing else, it is to sacrifice our right to live for ourselves. It is to sacrifice our life for living according to the way the world lives and instead live sacrificially for Jesus and serving others for Jesus. That was the illustration he was making here in, in these two verses. The person who tries to hang on to their worldly, self-centered way of life Separated from Jesus, apart from Jesus, will lose any hope of eternal life in paradise. Instead, they receive what? Eternal damnation in hell. Well, the person who readily sacrifices their worldly life, the person who comes to Jesus in faith and denies, denies themselves... by dying in Jesus Christ, will keep real life, life in paradise in the presence of God for all of eternity. Some of the scriptures, and I could, teach, I could speak the rest of the time about these, but obviously I'm not going to, but scriptures relating to dying to self. Um, Romans 6, 1-14 through 14, talks about the old self being crucified with Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says we have, we, we have died and now we live for Jesus. The old is gone and the new has come. Um, Galatians 6.14 says, I have been crucified to the world in the cross of Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. All those verses and more in the New Testament talk about this idea of dying to self in faith to, through faith in Jesus. And that's what we're called to, folks. That's what we're called. That's how we're called to live. To deny ourselves and live for Jesus. To consider ourselves dead and now Jesus is actually living in and through us. That's how we're to go about life. And man, I didn't get that for a long time. Even after I had accepted Jesus as my Savior, I didn't get that. And I sure didn't live it. By the way, the, this expression, the one who hates his life, should not be understood to mean that that means we're supposed to you know, have contempt for ourselves or have suicidal tendencies or anything, but it, it means we are to make Jesus and serving Jesus our priority in life rather than focusing on ourselves to the extent that 
If you would look at our, how much we focus on ourselves, it looks like we hate ourselves compared to how much we focus on serving Jesus. It's like a hyperbole. We are to serve Jesus as slaves in this life. In, in our lives, we must be willing to go as Jesus went. We are to be willing to, get, to, to live sacrificially to the point that Jesus lived sacrificially. And that's a high bar, again, as it always is. And then God will give us honor and glory in the next life, in eternal life. That can be a hard pill to swallow in this life, but that is what we're, we're called to. Verses 27 through the first part of 28. Now my heart is troubled, Jesus said, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. At this time, Jesus was already beginning to feel the, the emotional pain and the struggle of what He was about to go through. He knew it was going to be agonizing. He knew He would suffer horrifically, both emotionally and physically. And He was anxious about it. He was troubled. Surely we can imagine how we'd feel if we were facing death by torture, huh? This is what you've got to understand. That's how Jesus knows what it feels like to walk in our shoes. He actually felt this. He was God in human flesh with His godly attributes set to the side and could only do things as God enabled Him to do through the power of the Spirit while He was on this earth. He felt the agony that He was about to experience emotionally before He actually even went through it. And on top of that, I think He knew something about what it was going to feel like when, he, when the Father placed the sins of the world upon Him as He hung on that cross. But at the same time, he knew he had to go through it. He was, he was starting to really be troubled about it, but he, he knew he had to go through it because why? It, it's the whole reason he came to the earth the first time. It's the whole reason that he had temporarily left heaven and permanently added a human body to his nature as God. He had done all that to get to this time. He wasn't going to ask the Father to take, take that away. He was born in a human body so that He could die to pay the price for human sin. So He wasn't going to quit. He was going to fulfill the Father's will. He was going to glorify the name of God by making the greatest sacrifice that has ever been made, or ever will be made, or ever could be made. This is second part of verse 28 through verse 30. Then a voice came down from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd, said, the crowd that was there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others, though, said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. The occasion of God's voice sounding from heaven, <clears throat> this is the third time um, recorded in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of God's voice sounding while, while Jesus was on the earth, sounding from the heavens. Each time it happened, it was an acknowledgement of the Father, of the authenticity and the authority of God the Son, Jesus Christ, as well as an endorsement of what He was doing. John said unmistakably that the voice was a genuine sound that people could hear. But it wasn't completely understood because some thought it thundered. Others said that an angel had spoken to Jesus. The other times that God's voice came, you know, sounded from the heavens was in the beginning of Jesus' ministry when He was what? Baptized. And then what was the other time? The transfiguration. When God's voice spoke approval. Um, of course, there were only uh, Peter, James, and John there to hear it that day. Jesus explained that the voice of heaven was intended to encourage the disciples and inform the crowd not to encourage Him. Why didn't, why didn't Jesus need to hear that from God to, to be encouraged by it? Careful. Well, why, why did He already know? Because the Father would have already been telling Him. 
because again he was in constant communication with with the father the father was revealing things to him all the time the father had already filled him in on all of this and therefore when the father said that Jesus said that was for the benefit of those who heard it it wasn't for his benefit he already he already knew it because the father had already explained all this stuff to him verse 31 now is the time for what? Judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Judgment here didn't mean that, the, that, that this was going to be the final day of judgment. You know, the final day of judgment will, will happen. Happen at, at what? The great white throne. Now, th this, this wasn't referring to that or anything. It was a time for, for the judgment of sin here on the earth that would be accomplished how, how, would the, how would the judgment of, on, on sin be accomplished in what was soon to happen? Think about it. What, 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 what would, how would the judgment of God be carried out? I, I, I think I heard a few of you saying the right answer. It was when, when God would place the sins of the world on Jesus as He died on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, it was the judgment of God that was put upon Him that should have been put on me and you and all the other sinners. It was the judgment of God that was poured out, the wrath of God that was poured out on Jesus as He hung on the cross. That is how judgment would soon come to the earth. Jesus would bear the wrath and judgment of God against sin. As He died on the cross, and because of sin, Jesus would experience the judgment of God to pay the price for the sin of the believers of all the ages, actually, of mankind on the earth. And that's another subject about how Jesus paid the price for sins of people who lived and died before He ever did it. But you'll have to ask me that some other time. I don't have time for that this morning. The prince of this world is, of course, who? Satan. That is Satan. Paul referred to Satan with similar kinds of titles like the God of this age and, and um, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The cross and the resurrection doomed Satan to defeat. It ultimately assured the destruction of sin, death, the grave, and Satan himself. Although God allowed, still allows Satan to be active at this time, it says in 1 Peter that Satan is what? prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan is, God allows him to still be active at this time, but his time is limited. Because his destiny is already secured. Where, where is his destiny? The lake of fire. Death itself, along with the unbelievers of all the ages, will end up in the lake of fire so that then at that time there will be no more death and there will be no more sin. See Revelation chapter 20. So I believe ultimately Jesus' reference here is to Satan's eventual complete destruction by Jesus' death and resurrection. Verses 32 and 33. But I, Jesus still speaking, but I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So just as Jesus referred to himself as being lifted up back in John chapter 3, remember he compared how he would be lifted up like, what, what else, what did he compare that was lifted up? The snake on the pole, remember that? Well just here again he repeats about saying that he was going to be lifted up. He uses that illustration here again. The, the Greek word uh, translated lifted up as hypsu, and it is used in John only in reference to the death of Jesus. All people here, when it says that all people, um, what's it say? Uh, I will draw all people to myself. When it says that, that doesn't mean everybody gets saved. That's not what Jesus meant. Any reasonable study of the Bible will tell you that's not true. What does it mean? How would, what did Jesus mean by all people being drawn to Him? Anybody know? How about all kinds of people? 
Men, women, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, doesn't matter. All kinds of people would eventually be drawn to Jesus. Those who are drawn to salvation in Jesus will come from every tribe and language and people and nation. Revelation 5, 9. And this is another of Jesus' references like, like He used earlier in the, in the Gospel of John about that, that there's all these, all these different sheep, right? But, but they're all going to end up in what? In one pen. With who is their shepherd? Jesus. With Jesus as their shepherd. This is another kind of a illustration he used to refer to that. That it was going to be all peoples, would, all variety of peoples would, would come to him and end up being his sheep. Verses 34 through 36. Well, now the, cr the crowd chimes in. The People in the crowd spoke up and says, We have heard from the law that the Christ, the Messiah, will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, You're going to have the light just a little while longer. While you have the light, before darkness overtakes you. Or walk while you have the light, before darkness overtakes you. The one who walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Put your trust in the light while you have it, so that you may become sons and daughters of light. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid themselves from him. Now, I don't think people in the crowd realized that Jesus was referring specifically to the way he would die by being lifted up on a cross. John tells us that's what Jesus was illustrating. I don't know that the people in the crowd realized that he was talking about dying on a cross, but they apparently were starting to get it that he was talking about dying. You know, maybe they thought when he said he would be lifted up from the earth, they just thought, you know, meant that he would be leaving and going to heaven or, or whatever. I don't know that they knew exactly what he meant, the illustration he was using about being lifted up on the cross, but they were starting to get it that he was saying he was going to die, and now, now they're going, oh, wait a minute now. Whoa! Whoa, Nelly. You know, these are the people that are what, ready for Jesus to do what? The Jews who are ready for Jesus to do what? Bring in the kingdom. Bring in the kingdom reign as king over this powerful nation of Israel. Get rid of them stinking Romans. You know, this is the Messiah they were looking for. Now, wait a minute. Now he's talking about dying. Wait. How, wait, wait. How's that going to work? Based on Old Testament passages like Isaiah 9, 7... Ezekiel 37, 25, and especially Daniel 7, 13, the Messiah, the son of David, was supposed to come and defeat God's enemies and establish this everlasting kingdom of peace and righteousness. In making the covenant with David, God promised him that his descendants would reign forever. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Psalm 89 is a hymn in praise of God's uh, favor to David and it affirms the same thing. And so if Jesus was the Messiah, how was He going to do that stuff if He was going to die? But as we've seen many times, we know that Jesus eventually will do that. When what? He returns. When He returns. When He comes a second time. It's not that He isn't going to do it. It's just that He wasn't going to do it then. Because he had a little bit of something else to do, right? He needed to die on the cross, like we just talked about, to pay for sin. And of course, that's also spoken of in the Old Testament, Isaiah 52 and 53, and there's allusions to it in Psalm 22 and Psalm 69. Jesus was causing a problem now. These people that were looking for Him to deliver them, calling out to Him, Hosanna, and others saying, Whoa, 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 what did you say? Wait a minute here. Well, Jesus is the light of the world. Here He told the crowd of Jews that He would not be with them much longer to light their way spiritually. If they didn't get in His spiritual light pretty soon, they were going to find themselves in spiritual what? Darkness. Darkness. You know, in that day, if, if somebody was traveling somewhere, walking somewhere... And if they didn't get to where they were going before it got dark, you know, they didn't have flashlights, they didn't have cell phones with lights on them. You know, generally, if someone like ran late and it was taking longer to get somewhere than they thought, 
what would happen is they'd be, and if it was, especially if it was a cloudy night, no stars and moon and so forth, probably all of you have been out in, like in, in the night when there's no light from the moon or the stars, you, you can't see nothing. I mean, you can't, you can't see your hand in front of your face. And these people would end up, if, if they get caught like that, they'd be literally like feeling their way along like blind people if they didn't get to their destination in time because they had no way to make any artificial light. And Jesus essentially, is that's what He's telling them. Soon I'm going to be gone, so the light's going to be gone, and you're going to be wandering around in spiritual darkness. You won't be able to see. Well, Jesus then left and would not appear to speak publicly again. This was his last public address that he made while he was on this earth. Some say he supernaturally hid himself. It just says he hid himself. Some commentators believe that he somehow supernaturally, you know, uh, disappeared, you know, into the another dimension or became invisible or something. I don't know, but I, I, it's another place where I just I don't see it in the. It just says. Jesus left and hid himself from them. So, kind of sounds like when you know my grandson goes and hides from me. You know, I, there's not. I, I just I don't see the supernatural side of it. Anyway, verses 37 and 38. Now, I'm gonna have to start buckling in here. When we get down through this last section here. I gotta check my time. Uh, I'm gonna have to. Really plow here, but you, you need to really you need to really track with me on this, or you, you'll 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 get left in the dirt pretty quickly. This is not the easiest stuff. Verses thirty seven and thirty eight. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still what would not believe, would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Despite the numerous miracles Jesus had done, despite all that He had taught, His profound teaching, despite all that had been revealed about Him to the Jewish people, the Jewish people still stubbornly refused to believe in Him. The hatred and the evil intentions of the religious leaders of the Jews was now starting to combine with the unbelief of many people who were now thinking Jesus is a false Messiah. We thought He was the one. He is a fake. And that's what most of them came to believe. These combined forces, the combination of the hate and evil of the, lead, the religious leaders and, and these, these disillusioned Jews, rank and file Jews, the general people who thought that, that Jesus was ushering in the kingdom right then and there, the, the combination of those two people would result in the climax of the rejection and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And John connected that with the prophecy in Isaiah. And that, that quote from Isaiah 53.1 clearly affirms that Jesus was the subject of the suffering servant in Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. And that's a prophecy that's quoted repeatedly in the New Testament. I have several quotes of Peter's here. Peter uh, quoted, uh, mentioned that prophecy in chapter 3 in Acts, but I'm not going to read them for time because I'm starting to fall behind. 39 and 40. Hey, now you really got to hang on here. Focus on this now. 39 and 40. For this reason, and that's important, think, think about what, what reason. For this reason, they what? could not believe. Because as Isaiah says elsewhere, He has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. Now, now please try to, try to track with me here. John's quote here, from this is from Isaiah chapter 6. Sa same prophet Isaiah that he quoted in the previous two verses, but now this is chapter 6. And this is a, this is these are verses that can really get people have people get their knickers in a twist. I'm going to try to go through it quickly, but as always, if you still have questions, please don't hesitate to get a hold of me. I'll, I'll gladly talk with anybody that wants to talk about this. It's not the, the easiest of stuff. First, I want you to notice the order of the statements here in the previous two verses I read, and now these two verses. One in verses 37 and 38, the previous two verses we just read. 
John pointed out that the Jews in the days of the prophet Isaiah would not believe, no matter what was revealed to them. And he compared that to, that just like them, the Jews in Jesus' day would not believe, no matter what was revealed to them. Tracking with that? That's the first comparison. He said, just like the Jews in Isaiah's day, the Jews in Jesus' day would not believe in Him no matter what was revealed about Him. That's the, that's the first step. That's the first thing. Num number two. In these two verses, 39 and 40, G John pointed out that because both the Jews in Isaiah's day and the Jews in Jesus' day would not believe, then both of, both of those groups of Jews, what? Could not believe. Now listen, try, you got to track closely. This is talking about God's blinding of eyes, hardening of hearts, God's blinding of spiritual eyes and deadening of spiritual hearts, first of all, is a righteous, justified act of judgment. Listen, there have never been, nor will there ever be, any morally good and righteous people who genuinely seek God on their own. Seek to know God on their own. But whom God does not allow to find Him or see Him or believe in Him. It is, not, <clears throat> there is, it is not a matter of somebody, some morally good person, is, is, they want to know God, and they want to come to God, and they want to find Him, but God's not letting Him. That God's not allowing her. It, that doesn't happen. That never happens. It's because they will not believe that they then cannot believe. It is not God saying, I'm not going to allow you to believe. This is critical in understanding this, as well as a whole lot of other biblical doctrine. And it refutes some of the major criticisms of a Calvinistic theology, which I remain more than ever convinced is the correct understanding of Scripture. Romans 3.11 says that there is no one who seeks God. On their own, there is no one who seeks God. The spiritual blinding and hardening of God then is a result of the fact that no one seeks God. Hang with me. Many people wrongly believe that in eternity past, God looked into the future and He saw those who would believe in Him. And then those that he saw would eventually believe in him, then he called them the elect. Well, that's not much of an election if it's based on what the person would do, but that's, that's the viewpoint of a lot of people in Christianity that I and many others believe is wrong and not biblical. It was actually the opposite. In eternity past, when God looked to the future, when he designed people with a free will and the ability to make their own choices, what did he see? He saw that no one would choose him. He didn't see that so many people would choose Him. And then He said those will be the blessed ones. No! In eternity past, God saw with His design of people to have free will and He looked into the future and He, he saw that no one would believe in Him. No one would come to Him on their own. No one would seek Him on their own. That's what God saw in eternity past. And so God sovereignly chose some who otherwise would have rejected Him, to be the elect. And so that He would then not bring judgment upon them. And how did He ensure that He would not bring judgment upon them? He enabled them. He caused them. He drew them to seek Him and believe in Him. It was Him bringing the people to Himself because they, what? Would not... That's what this is saying. The rest of the people, the rest of the people that in eternity past God didn't choose to overrule them and give them the ability to seek and believe in Him, the rest of the people, what did God do to them? What did God need to do to them 
to ensure that they wouldn't, wouldn't accept Him. <laughs> Not a blessed thing. God didn't have to do anything to anybody to, to deny Him, to refuse to seek after Him. All He had to do was let them alone. Let them choose their own way. Let them fall to their own choices. <clears throat> simply by not enabling people, simply by not causing people, not drawing people to seek Him, God, and believe in Him, God brought judgment upon them. It condemned them that they weren't going to come to faith. Why? Because they again, what? Would not come to faith. He saw already. And that's what these passages are saying. That both of the Jews of Isaiah's time. As well as the Jews on the earth. And when Jesus uh, was on the earth. And people still today. People will not come in faith. They will not seek God on their own. And therefore it is only the ones that God steps in. And gives them the faith. Draws them. John, we saw in John 6, 44 and 65, Jesus said, that's why none of you will come to me unless the Father draws you to me. Or unless the Father, in verse 65 in John chapter 6, unless the Father enables you to come to me. Otherwise, you won't do it. Some people are saved even though they would choose not to be. I hope you all are one of those people. I am. I'm saved by faith in Jesus, but I wouldn't have done it if it was just left up to me. Amen. God enabled me, drew me, caused me to seek Him out and believe. People are not saved, unsaved and condemned because God keeps them from being saved. They're condemned and under God's judgment because why? They what? would not believe despite all the revelation God gives them including Romans chapter 1 which is called natural revelation the, the creation and the world around us where God says that in and of itself is enough to condemn you for not seeking me out that you deny and look around in the creation of this world and this universe and you deny me that in and of itself is enough to condemn you God spiritually blinds and spiritually hardens by not showing mercy and grace to cure spiritual blindness and hard hearts that is self-inflicted. The way He hardens a person, an unbeliever's heart is, He simply allows it to be hard. He allows their eyes to stay blind. He doesn't step in and show the grace and mercy that He has shown me, who also would not have chosen Him if it were not for God's actions. And so the people get what they choose. Unbelievers get what they choose, which would be the same thing I would have chosen. That's what this is all about. I know it's tough stuff, and for some of you it's really tough because it goes against what you've been taught. I ask, all I ask is discuss it with me based on what the Word of God says, not based on... What somebody told you, or this, or that, or the other thing. Let's talk about it in turn. Let's you you exposit this these, this set of verses with me, and show me how that that's not what this says. That because people would not believe, they then could not believe, and the reason they could not believe is because of their own choice. They would not, without God doing something about it. In a nutshell, that's what it is. Verse forty-one. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about Him. What's that say? Isaiah saw Jesus' glory. How long ago Jesus, How long before Jesus did Isaiah live? Like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. How did he see Jesus' glory? It's referring to Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah was given a vision of the throne room of God. He saw the glory of Almighty God, Yahweh. And here John says that Isaiah saw Jesus' glory. What's, what's, what's it saying? Jesus was forever. That he's, he's referring to Jesus as Yahweh. 
That, that, that name that a lot of Jewish people a lot of times in history weren't even allowed to say. It was considered so holy. Yahweh, the, 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 the uh, leader of angel armies. It's identifying Jesus with the Yahweh of the Old Testament. Earlier, Jesus said Moses wrote about Him, and here John says Isaiah saw His glory. Jesus is the great I Am. Jesus is the Creator and the Sustainer of the universe. Jesus is God. He is Almighty Yahweh. Verses 42 and 43. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in Him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. John notes that there were a number of the Jewish religious leaders who actually truly believed in Jesus. Probably two, two guys that were probably among them were who? Nicodemus, Nicodemus and Joseph. Joseph of Arimathea. And we see in John, we'll see later in John 19 that they actually buried Jesus, went and asked for his body and, and buried him. But it's sad to understand, though, that John also said they weren't willing to sacrifice their positions in the Sanhedrin, which they would have done if they would have confessed their belief in Jesus as Messiah. Once again, I also say that we better take a good look at ourselves. Before we look down our righteous noses at these Jewish religious leaders who were afraid to lose their position in the Sanhedrin and confess their faith in Jesus, I say, what about us? What are we willing to sacrifice for Jesus? We know Jesus was not only the Messiah. These guys basically had come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He hadn't died yet. It had nothing to do about, you know, believe that He died on the cross for their sins and all that kind of stuff. That's what we know now today. And that's what we have to believe in. And so we know a lot more. We know He died to pay the penalty for us that we should have to pay. How willing are we to sacrifice for Jesus then? What do we do with the, that knowledge that we have today? What do we sacrifice because of what we know about Jesus? That is real life Christianity. And again, there are people all over the world that die for Jesus. Verses 44 through 46. Almost done here. Then Jesus cried out, When a man believes in Me, he does not believe in Me only, but the One who sent Me. When he looks at Me, he sees the One who sent Me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in Me should stay in darkness. Jesus is the, the perfect manifestation of God to humanity. We also see that in Colossians chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 1. Two, two big New Testament statements about Jesus being the very manifestation of God Himself to humanity. If you believe in the Jesus of the Bible, then you believe in the God of the Bible. If you don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible, then regardless of what you think, you don't believe in the God of the Bible. You might believe in a God of your creation or of someone else's creation, but if you don't believe in the Jesus that's described in the Bible, you don't believe in the God who is revealed to us in the Bible. There is no other option. You can't have one without the other. As we read in 1 John 2, 2 verse 23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. The Father and the Son are inseparable. They are two personalities, but they work as one being. In the Incarnation, God the Father sent God the Son to become the God-Man, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the spiritual light that illumines the spiritual darkness of all those who are without God, regardless of what they think. And there are many people who think they have God, think they know God, but because they do not have the Son in the way that the Bible says they have to have the Son, they are in darkness. They do not have God, whether they think they do or not. Finally, verses 47 through 50. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him in the last day. For I did not speak of my own accord, 
But the Father who sent me commanded me to say what to say and how to say it. I know that His command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Yet another illustration in the Gospel of John that Jesus only did and spoke what the Father told Him to do and speak and enabled Him to do and speak while He was on the earth because He had temporarily set aside the independent use of His attributes as God. Jesus told the Jews that He wasn't on the earth to judge anyone. He had come to save those who would believe in Him. He had come to die, again, as the price for atonement for sin. But judgment on unbelief is inevitable. Jesus clearly communicated the message from God the Father. Eternal life could be found only through who? Jesus. Jesus. There was no other way. Those very words that Jesus said as directed by the Father that there was no other way to eternal life in heaven but through Him, those very words spoken by Jesus, given to Him by God the Father, will condemn all believers one day at the great white throne judgment. God's command is to believe in His Son for eternal life. That's good news. Jesus Christ has overcome the spiritual darkness of the world for all who would believe in Him. But unbelief leads to judgment and ultimately eternal condemnation in the lake of fire. Jesus wasn't on the earth the first time to judge anyone, just like He said. He came the first time to die to save people. But He wasn't saying He would never judge anyone. Because we already saw again earlier in the Gospel of John that in fact the Father had given all authority to judge to the Son. When Jesus returns to the earth the second time, He will come in judgment. Amen. And then ultimately after His thousand year reign on this earth as King over the promised kingdom of Israel, and then this whole earth is destroyed and the heavens and everything is redone in the new heaven and in the new earth, before that begins will be the great white throne judgment. And that judgment will be executed by none other than Jesus. And He will send again the unbelievers of all the ages into eternal damnation in hell. That's what makes salvation so great, folks. What are we saved from? <laughs> in Jesus dying for us, what did He save us from in addition to what did He give us hope to have for all of eternity? I just want to, I want you to listen to these words. I want to take the time. It won't take long. These are the, these are the lyrics to the closing hymn. Please, when you sing this, Listen to me now. You've got plenty of time to get ready to go. Please, li please listen to these. And when you sing it, sing these words with meaning. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain that I could possibly have it counts but loss. And I pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that, that, I, that I should boast about anything except for the death of Christ, my God. All the vain things that charm me most in this life, I sacrifice them to His blood. See, look at Him from His head, His hands, His feet. Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Picture of the blood flowing down His body as He was tortured and killed. Did ever such love and sorrow come together, meet? Did ever thorns compose so rich of a crown? Did that ever happen? Were the whole realm of nature mine? If I, if I owned everything in creation, that were a present far too small for me to give to the one who saved me. Love so amazing... So divine demands my soul, my life, my all. I, I pray that you can sing those words from your heart personally because you have accepted Jesus as your Savior. Would you stand with me and sing them in that way? 324.